Hello, everyone. It, I have um, five o'clock um, straight up on the East Coast anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. I'm glad you are all here with us this evening. Um, I am Eileen Thrower, and I am the Interim Department Chair for the Department of Midwifery and Women's Health at Frontier Nursing University. Um, we have a couple of other, uh, I have a couple of other folks with me from Frontier. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves really quickly. Um, Dr. Jacobson, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, hey everyone. I'm Noelle Jacobson. I'm the Interim Clinical Director for the Department of Midwifery and Women's Health. So happy to see you tonight. I'm joining you from Orlando. I'm also an FNU grad, CNUP 34. Thank you. And I didn't say I'm actually joining tonight from, um, I live in the Athens, Georgia area. So, um, all right. I see Katie. Do you want to introduce yourself, Katie? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Katie Graves, and I am one of the clinical advisors here at Frontier. Uh, I'm part of the clinical outreach and placement team, and um, I'm coming to you from Versailles, Kentucky, about 10 minutes from campus. All right, thank you, Katie. And Susan? Uh -huh. Hi, I am Susan Williams. I'm in admission services, and I am Coming to you here from beautiful Lexington, Kentucky. All right, great. I also see a couple of other staff members. I don't know if they're, they don't have their cameras on. So um, we have a couple of other staff folks, but I'm really glad to see all of you with us tonight. So we're going to go over, um, a, hopefully answer a lot of questions that you may be having if you're, as you're considering um, maybe thinking about um, pursuing a, a career in nurse midwifery at Frontier. Um, so as you're joining, if you don't mind to make sure your cam uh, your microphones are muted. And if, if you would like to join on by camera, we'd love to see your faces, but either way is okay. Um, so as we already told you, I'm Dr. Thrower and Dr. Jacobson and I, um, I'm the, uh, we sort of are the two folks that um, try to sort of navigate the ship a bit for the Department of Midwifery at, at Frontier. Um, one of the most exciting things to me, one of the most unique and special things at Frontier is something that was on that first screen and then also on this slide, but we have a real culture of caring at Frontier that I think is palpable from the minute that you uh, begin to interact with the Frontier community. Um, our mission on this is um, printed at the bottom of the slide here. Um, we are all about um, providing education to prepare nurse midwives and nurse practitioners um, with a real focus on rural and underserved areas. Um, I think this is a thing that really makes Frontier special because of we're not only a nursing university, so everything that we do focuses on nursing, but we really focus very specifically on advanced practice nursing, and that's our entire mission and goal. So um, it ends up providing a lot of really unique opportunities, I think, for our students that we'll talk about as we move along in the presentation. So Frontier is one of the earliest distance education programs um, in the country to offer nurse midwifery education and nurse practitioner education. We, um, as I already said, we have a culture of caring. And I think this is one of the things that is really, um, that I, I think one of the things that we appreciate the most about being part of the frontier community. Um, other institutions um, don't always feel um, as supporting and caring as we would love for them to. And I, that's a really intentional goal of ours at Frontier. But the other exciting thing about it is that it allows, our program allows you to stay at home, do your work from your own home, which ends up being your classroom. And then um, you do, in our Nurse Midwifery program, end up traveling to campus two times, once at the beginning of the program for what we refer to as Frontier Bound. And that's basically an orientation session. Um, you're here for about four days. You would be in, in the, at the Versailles, Kentucky campus for about four days. And the other time is before you start your clinical practicum, you come back onto campus for a week long um, immersive experience where we really focus on clinical skills. So at Frontier, we have been um, 
teaching nurse midwives and nurse practitioners for over 80 years. We have students and alumni from every single state in the country. We have faculty from very from a lot of the states in the country. Um, we currently have about 2,500 students enrolled and over 8,000 graduates. And all of those graduates are either um, nurse midwives or nurse practitioners um, that have gotten their master's degree with us for their um, advanced practice nursing degree or gone on to, got, to receive their doctor of nursing practice degree. Um, we're really excited to announce that Frontier was named as um, one of the best online programs for graduate nursing in 2022. Also, we've been um, recognized as one of the top colleges for diversity and um, have also received international distance learning awards. So um, what I the way I really think about it is we Frontier's been doing distance education for a very long time, really before distance education was even um, something that people knew about. We were doing distance education when distance education wasn't really even a thing. Um, but the beauty of that is that we've had a lot of time to perfect it. I mean, a lot of inst practically every educational institution in the country and on the planet for that matter became a distance education in the last two years. Um, for Frontier, we didn't miss a beat. That's what we'd always been doing. And so it was a very seamless transition for us. And I think that um, one of the things that I really like the most about Frontier is that I hear over and over from students that they feel more connected and more supported in this environment, even though we're all over the country than they, than they have in other institutions where they've been attending live in person at a brick and mortar institution. So I think that um, a lot of that well, not a lot of it, really the full explanation for that is the people at Frontier. So these are a few of the um, the people that work with students. So what I, the way we really look at it is when you join, um, if, if you apply or, and, are on, and are enrolled in Frontier, as you move through your educational journey, you have a whole team of people working with you. You have a whole group of people that will that walk alongside you through that whole journey. So you've already met um, Dr. Jacobson and I. In addition to that, of course, as you're doing your um, academic courses that you would be doing from, from home, online, um, on the computer, you would have a course coordinator for every course and course faculty. Now you can look at that number of students, we have 2,500 students enrolled, and you might be guessing that some of our classes are fairly large, and if that's what you're guessing, you would be right, but um, it's a very different experience because you're not in an auditorium kind of setting where you're one of many people in a, in a large classroom because you're doing this online. Um, our courses have multiple faculty members that that really have a smaller group of students that they work with throughout the course. So I think you I think you honestly feel like you're getting more individual attention than you would oftentimes in a classroom of the same size when you're meeting in person. Um, in addition to that, we have multiple clinical faculty that are that are lo live throughout the country, and they um, are assigned to really mentor and be and be the primary faculty person for the students in their region. So these um, our regional cl clinical faculty are nurse midwives that um, are really a, with you as you're walking through your clinical courses and doing your clinical practicum. Um, that's a really important resource because of the fact that these um, clinical faculty members live in the same region that you do. They oftentimes are quite familiar with the clinical um, sites and the preceptors that are available to you. So they are really a great resource uh, for guidance. Other really important resources are the academic advisors and the clinical advisors. Um, each one of each of our students is a assign an academic advisor from the very beginning that is with you throughout the entire curriculum um, to help guide you with decisions about courses to take, helps help you navigate um, some of life's challenges and even um, really provide some support for you from an academic standpoint. Um, we have clinical advisors, Katie Graves introduced herself. She's one of our clinical advisors and our clinical advisors work alongside our students as they are working to identify a clinical site and clinical preceptors. So um, we have a, our clinical advisors are an amazing 
resource. They have put together and maintain a community map for us that has a list of all of the clinical sites that we have in the country. Katie, you can tell me the number, but the, at one time I know, I think we, can you tell me approximately how many clinical sites are on the community map? I think right now it's like 15,000, maybe. Yeah, I, I know at one time it was that. 12. So it, we have a, a really comprehensive list of all the sites that we've used in the past, all the sites that we know anything about, uh, we try to include them there. It's a searchable um, resource. It's a map that is searchable by your community and your program so that you could really see sites in, um, in a geographical location. Um, um, you also have a financial aid officer that would work with you throughout the program and then a credentialing coordinator. Our credentialing, of course, the financial aid officer, I think, is fairly self-explanatory. Our credentialing coordinators, once you have worked with your clinical advisor and your clinical faculty member to identify a site and a preceptor, that our credentialing quarters pick the ball up and take it from there to get all of the contracts in place so that the credentialing is taken care of. And that is not, uh, would not be your responsibility at all. Um, let's see, I've addressed a lot of this, so, but let me just kind of reiterate a couple of things. One, as you're looking for, um, because the way Frontier works is that you complete all of your academic courses first, and then you come onto campus for that clinical bound week, which is that clinical skills intensive week that I mentioned earlier, and then you begin your clinical practicum experience. When you, so, as you're moving through your academic courses, that's the time when you're really working with your clinical advisor and your regional clinical faculty to find those sites, find those preceptors, and then your credentialing coordinator gets that all set up so that you're ready to go. Your regional clinical faculty then really walks with you through that clinical journey. Um, there are, you would meet with them every two weeks. Um, and they are there to support you and your preceptor as you move through your clinical experiences. Um, we have, um, I think, already pretty much mentioned the academic and clinical advisors. We, I, I really do find, though, that one of the most important resources that our students have is each other. And I'm impressed over and over with the way our students form relationships, study groups, online study um, student groups. Um, over and over, we see groups of students sort of progressing through the program together, um, sort of staying on the similar tracks, being at the initial orientation session together, and then also coming to Clinical Bound together. So that ends up being a lot of fun. We have a good many, um, we have a lot of financial aid resources that we can help guide you towards and, and even scholarships. We have an amazing library. It's always very surprising. And it's a, a thing that I think many students are oftentimes very surprised about because you're thinking, how in the world do we have a library if we don't go to campus? But we have an amazing um, library with an amazing number of resources and even um, really a surprising number of electronic textbooks that are available. So that's really an um, important service. And then one of our biggest initiatives right now that we really value very strongly is our diversity impact program. This is something that we are threading throughout everything that we do, all of our curriculum and all of our events. Um, we are really trying to be aware of um, the importance of diversity, inclusion, and equity at this point. So I know as you're thinking about um, going to school and you're dreaming about uh, a career in midwifery, the top goal is kind of what that, the top line here is kind of what that dream looks like. And the bottom panel is a little bit more like life um, really presents itself to us. And of course, for the last two years, I think we're all pretty familiar with the fact that there are a lot of these kind of potholes in our road. But I'm really excited that you found your way to this session tonight and um, hope that you can all continue ahead on that journey to pursue this dream that you may have. Um, so if you're, um, if you're here thinking about a, a career in nurse midwifery, here are the options that Frontier provides. Um, we provide the Masters of Science in Nursing option. That's the program that most of our students do. Um, so that would mean that you would need to be a, an RN already. And, um, and have a bachelor's of science in something. Most of our students have a BSN. Um, 
And then another option is the postgraduate certificate. So the postgraduate certificate program would be for somebody who's already an advanced practice nurse, either a, a nurse, a family nurse practitioner, a pediatric nurse practitioner, something of that nature, and then it's coming back to add midwifery. And that would not be through another MSN program. That would be through the postgraduate certificate. And it does, it's a little bit, sh a little bit shorter length of time that it, that takes to accomplish. And then we also have the doctor of nursing practice. So all of our students that are accepted into either the master's program or the postgraduate certificate program are able to proceed into uh, to go continuously through and finish their DNP, or they could stop out, work for a length of time, get established in a career, and come back and finish the D DNP. Okay. Um, in terms of the time frame, um, so let me tell you a little bit about, about the way our calendar, our academic calendar works. We work on the term system. So we have four terms a year. There are four times a year that we accept and enroll and bring in new students. Um, so that's winter, spring, winter that starts in January, spring in April, summer in July, and then fall in October. That gives us four 11-week terms and then a two-week break between terms. So to complete a master's degree with Frontier, I would say on average is about a two and a half year experience. It can be done as fast as two years, although I would say that that is a route that is much more manageable for someone who has the luxury of not having to work or care for family, whether that's children or parents or whatever. I know for many of us, if not most of us, we have life and um, the need to pay the bills and keep the electricity on and all of that stuff. So I would say the majority of our students, uh, the vast majority <laughs> work and end up taking more like two and a half to three years to complete the program. Uh, the postgraduate certificate program, as I mentioned, is a little bit um, a little shorter. It can be done in a year, but again, I think that is probably only for that student that would somehow have the crazy ability to not have to work. So a, a more reasonable time frame is more like a year and a half for that. And then the time frame to if you wanted to add that doctor of nursing practice after the completion of the MSN, the time frame for that is about 15 to 18 months. So admissions criteria for that master's degree include, as I already mentioned, you have to be a registered nurse with a current active license. You've got to have a bachelor's degree. Um, you've got to have at least a 3.0 cumulative GPA from your highest nursing degree. Okay. Um, and then be in good academic, at good academic standing in your prior educational work and have one year of experience as an RN. It doesn't have to be in any particular field as an RN, but you do have to have a year of nursing experience. You have to have it, uh, and correct me, Susan, if I'm wrong, you have to have a year of nursing experience at the time of admission, not the time of application. Will you, or will you say that the correct way? I muted myself. At the time of the beginning of the term. When you would, the, yeah. So when you would actually start the program, you have to have a year of experience. Correct. Yeah. So it is possible to begin the application process before you've completed that year of um, nursing, that first year of experience. Um, for the postgraduate student that might be considering applying the admissions criteria, again, you have to have an RN with a current active license. For the postgraduate certificate, you have to already hold the master's degree. You have to have a 3.0 cumulative GPA at least from that highest nursing degree. And then there's the whole list of specialties um, that, you might be a, that you might be in as an advanced practice nurse that would allow you to come back and add a postgraduate certificate program. So it's a pretty comprehensive list. If there's another kind of advanced practice nurse out there, it doesn't come straight to my mind at least. One thing about um, Frontier that I love and I, and I think our students experience when they come to the very first session is you show up and you spend a little time talking to the people that you're with and what you find very quickly is, or at least what I found is, these are my people. It's so refreshing to be with a group of very like-minded people who are all here um, with a very similar purpose and a very similar mission. Um, it, it, it's a very um, unique place in that respect and something that I value highly. 
Okay, so upcoming application deadlines. If you're considering applying, the um, deadline to begin the program in the summer, which begins in the beginning of July, that deadline would be March 23rd. Or if you're looking to um, begin the coursework in the fall or in the beginning of October, then the deadline for that would be April 20th. Um, the application steps are here. The, the application is available online. It does require writing some essays. Um, you have to include your resume. You have to have three ref uh, references from healthcare professionals. You have to obtain your transcript from prior, prior institutions. And if you are a student that is an RN but has a bachelor's in something other than nursing, you have to. There, there's a separate portfolio that's required. You see the um, the cost of the the tuition per credit hour there at the bottom of the screen. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that clinical experience um, that you would have as a as a student here with us at Frontier. For students that are getting the master's degree, it requires 675 clinical hours, which um, could be done in um, as little as 16 weeks, although that would be a 40 hour a week commitment to do it that fast, and that's very unusual. The more typical thing is more like four to six, more like around six months rather than the four month mark. Um, and then the postgraduate students are required to do 540 clinical hours, and that can be done at a minimum of 14 weeks, but again, typically it lasts a little bit longer than that. Um, that that doctor of nursing practice program requires an additional 360 clinical hours. Um, in addition to the number of hours that are required, there are also specific visit types that are required for the midwifery degree. One of the biggest that our students are uh, really well aware of and working towards is that as um, midwifery students at Frontier, you have to catch 40 babies to graduate, um, which is a lot of fun and exciting. Um, and sometimes that can take a little time, depending on how busy the site is, where our students are doing their clinical practicum. Sometimes they've completed their 675 hours, but haven't quite caught 40 babies yet. So it can take a little bit longer if you're in a practice that's not very busy. Students that are in a really busy practice can get done easily in those 675 hours. So this is just an alumni spotlight. This is one of our graduates who became the first nurse midwife in her area to provide care for um, hospital births with 24-7 coverage. I will tell you that um, we see this over and over that our students are really innovators. They are um, blazing trails that um, haven't been blazed before and establishing midwifery all over the country. So it's um, really an amazing group of people to be associated with. Here's another one of our um, graduates who um, finished her DMP program with us and then did a DMP project looking at shared decision making and um, facilitating patients to have a larger role in their birth experience. So that's the end of my slides, but I'd love to um, know if you have questions or um, anything you want to ask. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and encourage you to, um, Dr. Jacobson, have you been answering questions in the chat box as we've been going along? I've been helping and admissions has been helping as okay. well. Great, yep. thanks. I have been reaching out to all the admissions questions separately. Okay, um, thank you, Susan. Okay. Thank you. So what questions do you have that haven't been answered? Feel free to turn your mic on and ask or. Hi, um, I have a question. Okay, um, Amanda. So my fiance is in the Marine Corps and we're currently stationed in Hawaii. And so I was just curious, like are all the lectures live lectures or are they pre-recorded? There's very little um, content at Frontier that is done synchronously in a fashion that makes you show up at a given time. Okay. There is a, but there, there are some, there are some experiences in some courses that do require that, Amanda, but I will tell okay. you that um, we really try to 
be flexible and offer a lot of opportunities. We have students literally from all 48 um, continental United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. We're very aware of time of the time zone differences. Um, we try very hard not to um, have things on that are scheduled on East Coast time in the morning because we know that that's in the middle of the night for those folks that are really, you know, in Alaska and Hawaii. Um, often for most courses that do require that synchronous kind of session, there are multiple times and you can sign up for one that will work for you. Okay, perfect. Because I was just thinking if you guys had an 8 a.m. lecture on the East Coast, I wouldn't be able to make it. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be honest with you on, um, that we almost we do nothing at 8 a.m. on the East Coast time. <laughs> we would never schedule anything at 8 a.m. Um, we okay. First of all, I mean, I live on the East Coast and that makes me happy even for eight. But that certainly we understand would not work for our friends that are on the West Coast and even further um, East or further West. So no worries about that most of the most of the curriculum is really contained in an asynchronous fashion that you work on when it works for you but particularly as you move through the courses we do have simulated like simulated patient visits that you're needing mm -hmm. to do but we will always have a variety of times available and they're going to be spread throughout the day so that it works for every time zone okay awesome that's perfect thank you you're very welcome. One thing I will say is that you do have to be in one of the 50 United States, the 48 continental United States or Alaska or Hawaii to do your clinical practicum. We are not credentialing international sites. Similarly, we don't credential um, U.S. territories or U.S. military bases. It's just um, an added layer of complexity that we don't that we really cannot manage at this point in time. That makes sense. Yeah. What, what, I'm not on base. We live off base. So that wouldn't really be an issue. And, but, and Hawaii is fine. Hawaii is not a problem anyway. So you're good okay. there. <laughs> um, we do have, you know, we have a, a fair number of students who are either in the military themselves or military spouses mm -hmm. that will sometimes find themselves out of the country for a period of time. That is doable while you're doing the beginning part of the program, the academic courses that does that will not work though once you get to the end where the clinical course the clinical content takes place that has to be done in the United States okay that makes sense <laughs> all right what other questions do you have does anyone have hi this is Teresa hi Teresa how are you Good. Thank you all so much. This has been very informative. I do have two questions. One is in regards to the application process, because I've actually been a nurse for 11 years. So I definitely am not in contact with any of my preceptors um, at this point. So I'm just curious if you can give a few ideas to get for, you know, references. And is that current managers? Is that so um, if somebody can just maybe answer that a little bit, because it did say educational references. I mean, I have ones from, you know, 10 years ago, but I don't think they would be appropriate yeah. for now. <laughs> Susan, do you want to answer that? Right. And what they're looking for are two professional, you know, two supervisors and one peer. And what you want is someone who can attest to your skills as a nurse and how you function in that role. Um, and all you need is their email address and you put that in the application. And as soon as you fill that out, a form goes directly to them. They fill out the form. It's not like the old school letter of reference. They fill out the form, hit submit, it goes directly back into your application. So Teresa, that really you it doesn't you don't it definitely does not have to be somebody from a previous academic program. No. You really, it would actually would be like you're saying it would be very preferable to for it to be somebody who's currently working with you that can speak to your nursing competency. Exactly. Okay. That's what I figured. Thank you so much. I have one more question, if that's sure. okay. Yeah. Just in terms of, so I'm in Massachusetts currently, and I'm just curious about credentialing and once you I mean, it seems so far away, but um, that is always a question with the schools that I'm looking at right now, especially online programs. How does the credentialing process work in each state? Are we 
covered. Uh, maybe I'm not asking that correctly, so I apologize. But um, I just once you become, you know, a certified nurse midwife and go on take boards and things like that, is that something that's frontier is covered in every state? Is the credentialing covered? Am I? I don't think, yes, I don't we, are, that we are accredited are. as an education program for every state. We have uh, limitation. The state of New York has placed limitations on the number of students that we can have. They've placed limitations on the number of students for any nursing program that is not located in the state of New York. But with other than that, our, our accreditation covers all 50 states. So it doesn't matter where you would be working. Your cert, you would be certified. You would be our master's graduates and our PGC graduates are, um, per, are qualified to take the midwifery boards. They're um, administered by the American Midwifery Certification Board. And then that is recognized in all 50 states. Does that answer you the question? It definitely does. My apologies for asking. I had no. read online and it was New York. I, I thought it was New York. So I just wanted to clarify. Is that, that are you flying, living obviously. in New York, Teresa? No, no, I'm actually in Massachusetts. I'm okay, in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, no, no, no yeah. issues with Massachusetts at all. All right. Great. Thank you all. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Um, Susan, can you take this one too? Um, how long does it take to get admission decision roughly? Um, usually now that we have the new rolling admissions, this is brand new for us, but they're usually coming out pretty quick. So it's about four to six weeks after you submit your application, you get an admissions decision. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. Um, my name is Caitlin and I was wondering about if you guys could say what would clinical kind of look like? Would we be in an office or a hospital? Would we follow one person and just kind of like work their schedule? Okay, I'm going to turn that one over to Noelle. She's our clinical director, so she can talk to you about the clinical sites all day long. Yeah, so um, your goal in becoming a CNM is to do the entire full scope of practice as a CNM. So you're going to need an office-based practice where you're going to be doing office visits for tonal Bs and GYN and perimenopause and um, visits like that. And then you also need a place to do birth, which is not going to happen in the office, um, unless if something really major happens, it's going to make the news, right? Like people don't deliver in the office. And so you're going to need a hospital in order to do those births. For those of you who are interested in the birth center as an out-of-hospital birth model or a home birth center or a home birth site, those are also options. Um, however, we do have a requirement that you do a minimum of eight births in the hospital. That sort of higher acuity, but the rest could be done out of hospital. For birth centers, they must be CABC accredited, and you can Google that, CABC accredited. They have a map if that interests you. And then home birth sites are approved on an individual basis. And a lot of those requirements, honestly, are just based on our malpractice. We're the largest nurse midwifery program in the U.S., so we have a robust liability insurance, and we need to make sure we follow all of their requirements. All right, thank you, Dr. Jacobson. There's a question in the chat box, what support is given for preparation for boards? Um, first of all, let me say that our board, our first time board pass rate is significantly higher than the national average. Um, our graduates do are very successful with um, the board exams. And I think you're gonna find that an enormous amount of support is given. We, um, you know, our goal at Frontier is to prepare you to be a safe, competent, beginning level nurse midwife. But having said that, we know that one of the steps to get to that is passing boards. You can't practice as that safe, beginning, competent nurse midwife until you have passed boards. So we certainly um, are very aware of, of that of, of that as requirement and give you all the support we can. I will tell you that we have a comprehensive review course. And basically once you have, what our students say is when they take boards, their, their comments are oftentimes, oh, wow, that was really easy because board, because our comps course is more challenging and you're going to pass that comps course. Our students, you get through that comps course and then you're, you are very well prepared to take boards. I think you'll be in really good place there. Um, acceptance rates for the CNM program. 
Susan? Looks like Susan's looking. I was, I was actually answering her privately, but. Okay. Oh, no. okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that came to me privately. That's why I put it in the. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no, that was to everybody. I apologize. I'm getting lost in the chat. Yeah. And for making your application stand out, you know, spend time with it. Um, uh, faculty review these applicants. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of time in the essay because we really know that that's where you're going to stand out. Like we want to really want to hear your story. We really believe in you as an individual and in welcoming you to our community. So we want um, a really deep dive into who you are, what you're doing, what your belief systems are, what you're going to bring to the university. Um, I will tell you, there's nothing worse than reading an essay with typos. I'm like, really? You know, so take time, have like somebody who's really good at grammar, read it for you. You know, I'm sure you have somebody who um, writes well and can take a couple minutes to fix those sort of little glitches. Cause it is really like, mm, you know, when you're reading those things and we take points off for that as well. Just think of it like any paper for school, but mostly write it from your heart. We really want to hear from you and why you're here and, um, how we can look forward to you joining us. And one thing, the only thing I would add to that is another thing that makes you stand out, not only in your application process, but also really helps you be successful in the program is really some significant consideration to how you're going to manage your time and carve out enough time in your life to, to be successful in the program. Um, the, our students that are at the highest risk of not being successful are those that, that who, who just do not manage to find the time to give that they need for the, to complete their programs. Um, those expectations are, are um, pretty clearly stated about how much time each course is going to need. Um, so think about that now. If you, if you have a family that you're caring for and you're working full time, many of our students do. The question is, how are you going to make that work for you? We know that students can do it because they do it every single day, but it's something you really should think about. Um, there's another question about how far out from your first year of RN experience should you apply. Kennedy, that is really up to you. And I'll, Susan, are you putting that in the chat? And, you know, what I would say to that is. I've already answered. We see so many variations on that. We see people that when they get to, they've been a nurse for six months. So they do the math and they figure if I start applying now, by the time I start school, I'm going to have my one year. So I'm ready to go. And then we have people that have been nurses for 25 years or more. So there, I, I don't know what your answer was, Susan, but there is no one answer to that. What it's going to be, what it's right for you, basically. As long as you have one full year of basic bedside nursing, just generalized if it's a school nurse, a nursing home nurse, what they're looking for are those basic bedside nursing foundational skills. Um, for 12 full months and it doesn't specify of what you know type you need so just basic nursing Susan uh hi this is Carson did you hi. did you say um outpatient nursing is okay that's mostly yeah. where mine experience has been um, cause my goal is to work at like a Planned Parenthood or something like that, mm -hmm. um, and help low income, um, women or anybody. Um, that's why I want to do the women's health program. So yeah. in that, awesome. go ahead. well, I was just going to say that outpatient experience is going to be incredibly valuable for you. And if yeah. you're looking at the women's health nurse practitioner program, there's nothing that mm -hmm. would give you better background for that in a lot of ways. That's really ideal. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Susan, are you answering this one for those that have a bachelor's in another yes, field? I'm doing it now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And the application times are four times a year. Um, yeah, so if you will have a full year of experience in October of 2022, then you probably could begin to apply by that um, April deadline that we know, that we mentioned earlier. Someone had earlier had asked um, the question about clinicals and asked about following the preceptor schedule. And that is generally what most preceptors expect of you. So when you're meeting with preceptors, potential preceptors, you know, ask them, what does your life look like? You know, and then imagine you, yourself being plugged into whatever that schedule is. 
um, some midwives work really crazy hours, you know, like maybe five office days and every fourth weekend, some of them do less, like they're hospitalists and maybe they do three 12 hour hospital shifts. It just kind of depends. So that's the thing with work is that your midwifery education can't be a back burner thing. It's not like a hobby, right? It kind of has to come to the front of your commitments during the time you're in school. Um, so that was what Dr. Furrow was talking about, just really making sure that you are ready for that commitment. Katie, do you wanna add anything? Thank you, thank you for that, Dr. Jacobson. Um, Katie, do you wanna add anything about the clinical map or about Anna's question in the chat? Sure, and I'm sorry, my husband's vacuuming in the background, so. <laughs> no worries, he can come to my house next if he wants. Yeah. Well, well, trust me, it doesn't happen often. Um, but, um, so you will not have access to the community map until your first term at Frontier. Um, so when you come to Frontier Bound, um, and you come to actually my session and my other um, co-peep session, um, we will sort of go over the community map a little bit and you'll be able to play with it a little bit then, but you won't have actually full access until your first term. Um, so hope that answers your question, Anna. And sometimes it can be a challenge to find clinical sites. It just depends on how rural you know, maybe a rural, if you live in a rural area, that sort of thing. But that's why my unit was formed to help and support you in any way that we can, um, you know, to look for those sites and to reach out to those preceptors. I think the biggest thing when it comes to finding a site and preceptor is to start early and start making those connections, you know, join your national organization. So for midwives, that's ACNM. For women's health nurse practitioners, that's NWHNP. I think I got the initials right. And, um, and start going to those meetings and start knocking on doors at offices and bringing cupcakes and all those sort of things start for people to get to know you. Um, if you wait like a term before you're going to go to clinical bound, it's going to be tough, right? That's a tough turnaround. They've probably already made a commitment or maybe they already have a vacation scheduled to know that they can't, you know, some sites require a whole year in advance. Another thing that's really important for all of us to consider is the world in the COVID-19 sphere. And with that, Frontier is following CDC guidelines and CDC guidelines currently state that everyone should be dual vaccinated to congregate in public spaces. So to come to campus, which is a requirement, right? Two times, Frontier Bound for Orientation and Clinical Bound to kick off your clinical journey, um, you are required to be vaccinated. So please know that. And that's an admissions requirement now. So I don't want anybody to um, be wasting their time if that is not something that you've completed. And if I can just piggyback off that too, um, as clinical advisors, um, we have found that, you know, obviously sites change their requirements every day, but more and more and more sites are requiring the vaccination and the booster, in fact. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, if you're an employee at the site, it's a little bit different, I believe, but just know that it is, it is hard to find sites that do not require the vaccine and the booster. So just to throw that out there. Yeah, and again, Frontier could eventually change its policy to add the booster or whatever other immunizations are added to the CDC list. We aren't making up our own rules. We're just following CDC guidelines. So when the CDC changes, we change. Um, it's far too complex of a healthcare issue for us to be making our own policies. We just defer to the CDC. And with sites, they make their own policies and so do preceptors. And so, you know, with us having 15,000 sites, there are 15,000 different onboarding requirements. You know, you may have to do an extra EHR training or you may have to pay for an extra lab work like, in, like oh, we need a 2000 urine drug screen, the 12 one you gave us isn't enough. Whatever they tell you to do, you have to do. We are guests at clinical sites. So that's just something to remember. Those requirements are non-negotiable. So that's why it's really important for you to find the right fit for you. And um, having been um, the clinical director during the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been very painful for a lot of students. I've had students, seven births left, be ineligible to continue at a site because they weren't vaccinated. And that was a huge hardship. 
um, some people to get that far. Can you imagine all that work? And then all of a sudden, just sorry, you know, that particular student flew cross country and stayed at a very busy site that we found that wasn't requiring the vaccine, but that site even now requires a vaccine. So anyway, we, you know, our goal is to commit to you. You make a commitment to Frontier and we're going to make a commitment to help get you through. We want you to join and to get those initials after your name, whether they're CNM or WHMP, we want practitioners in the universe. That's the entire mission of Frontier. And so we're gonna do whatever we can to get you there. And we know that there are roadblocks that are gonna stop you. So that's why we tell you in advance about this New York rule where only so many students in New York can go there. And that's why we tell you about the COVID vaccine because all we want is for you to fulfill your dream and your mission. So there's a great question in the chat box about what is the clinical bound experience like and um, the clinical bound experience is really um, amazing, to be honest with you. We call it uh, midwife camp or nurse practitioner camp. Um, you spend a week on campus, you learn a lot of hand skills. So for our midwifery students, we have a lot of amazing um, different simulation models to teach you to catch babies. Um, we teach all of our midwifery and women's health students, nurse practitioner students, um, suturing, office procedures, and then we spend a lot of time doing simulated patient visits, both simulated outpatient visits, like office-based visits, and inpatient intrapartum visits, so that um, that, so that you are as well prepared as is possible once you enter the clinical site. Um, and we have a lot of preceptors who say who re actually refuse to take other students because they believe our students are better prepared when they get to their clinical and they're really ready to go and, and get started. Um, since you do all of your didactic or classroom, even though the classroom is your living room or wherever in your house that it works out, um, you do all of that academic coursework first, you've got all of that knowledge and then you come to come to campus and we begin to try to give you um, the big concepts at least of what I'm going to do with my hands so that you can go into the clinical setting and really begin to learn to apply the knowledge. Um, I will tell you that um, I think that the Frontier program works like a well-oiled machine. We've been doing this for a long time. Every single Every single day of your career, of your um, educational experience is very well thought out, um, and if you follow the process and believe in it and trust in it, you will be successful and pass boards on that first attempt and be safe, competent providers. Um, so, does Frontier Frontier does accept applications for religious exemptions? Um, However, at this time, there's really the question is whether or not there's any capacity for you. At this time, we are not allowing unvaccinated students to come to campus. And so that is um, where there's a little bit of an issue. So that would be something you could look out. You could look at, um, you could reach out to me separately if you would like to. You can email me at Eileen.thrower. You can see my name on the screen. So it's Eileen.thrower at frontier.edu. Um, so another question. I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. I'll answer that clinical practicum question. So Thank when you. you're in Perfect. clinical, you pretty much have had all of your didactic work done. Definitely WHMP students will have everything done. Nurse midwifery students, there's this in, you know, programs of study change, but there's this one sort of dangler. It's a, a primary care course that some students find they haven't finished in their um their preclinical work. And so then they do take it with like the first term that they're starting clinical, which is a lot to manage. But some students opt to do that and just kind of dive in and do that. But mostly our goal in clinical is what we call integration. Like we want you to be integrated into the role transition from RN to WHMP or CNM and just focus every single day on that transition. Um, even if you have 20 years of experience as an RN, I promise you, it's not going to be, you, right now you feel like you understand your role and what you're doing. And there's something magical that happens when you're in those CNM shoes in that hospital. And you're just like, oh, wait, I, I've been, I've done, you know, thousands of births and now I'm seeing it from a different perspective. I didn't even realize I didn't have that perspective before. It's like, you've been functioning with blinders and now you have to take a step back and become the leader. 
And um, students are, you know, you write reflections weekly when you're in clinicals and students write about that experience a lot, how shocking it is to them, how different it is than what they expected. And it's really fun as faculty to read those. We love to see as you blossom and grow. Um, it's a very exciting time for everybody. So just know that that's what we want you to do. We want you to be in clinical and only in clinical. Um, if you are not already in APRN and you're doing the MSN program, you do five clinical courses and um, you do about 20 hours a week of clinical. And those 20 hours don't include being on call for midwives. Like when you're sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring, you're not learning to become a midwife by sitting at home and watching Netflix, waiting for the phone to ring, right? It's actually only the time you're um, at the site, the hospital or birth center, whatever, doing births. Um, so for birth centers, you need to put in a lot of time because they're not about volume, right? They're about relationships. Um, of course, you probably get a lot of hours doing labor management because unlike maybe a more medical model, you're going to go in when as soon as the patient is admitted for birth at the birth center, whereas in the hospital, you may not go in until somebody's crowning. <laughs> Just sort of depends on your um, culture at where you're going. So yeah, goal is no didactic work when you are in clinical. You might have this one course if you're a CNM student. And then when you're wrapping up clinical, we would like you to be done with clinical before you take the final course that prepares you for boards. Um, but some students do overlap it. Again, it just depends on your bandwidth and how much you can manage and juggle. And then, yes, the answer to this last question in the chat box is you, you certainly can use a, an out-of-hospital precept, a certified nurse midwife as a preceptor. So nurse midwives that are working in birth centers and home birth practices are, are certainly eligible to be preceptors um, for us at Frontier. All right. I really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, it was really great to have a chance to chat with you. And feel free to reach out to us at Frontier. If you have questions, we're happy to answer more questions. 